I'm the founder of a company called Modal. We provide data infrastructure in the cloud. And I'm going to talk about a very deep rabbit hole I went down where I started wanting to build a better uh, set of tools for data engineers and data scientists. Uh, and then realized I had to do a lot of infrastructure to, to get there. But, but so real quick, and Taylor already talked about what, who I am. I've been working on Modal Labs for about two years. Um, I, you, I've been working with data for most of my career. In particular, I built a music recommendation system in Spotify, open source thing called uh, Luigi, which no one uses today, but at some point was widely used uh, as a workflow scheduler. I also built a thing called Annoy, which is a um, vector database, which also no one uses today, but used to be somewhat widely used. I have a blog, I tweet sometimes. Uh, I was a CTO for many years also. But yeah, that's it. So, so let's talk about this. Deep rabbit hole. I, th this talk is it's like kind of like two parts. I'm going to get very technical in like a little bit, but I wanted to contextualize it and like kind of have a preamble and like talk about why. Because technology is a means to an end. Like there's no point building tech if you don't have a goal. And so, um, well, there's a, the other point is it's actually fun. So it's fun to build tech, in my opinion. But, but that's me rationalizing. So, I started thinking about better tools for data engineers a couple years ago and, and, and almost like selfishly wanting to build a better tool for myself. Like, you know, having worked with data for so many years, like I wanted to build something that makes me happy when I write code and when I, you know, productionize stuff, when I schedule things out, when I use GPUs and I'm, you know, after banging my head against like AWS docs for 15 years, I figured like maybe we can build better abstractions. So. I don't think there's like a great way to quantify productivity and like how do you measure it? Like you can't, like lines of code, whatever, it's not a good thing. But when I think about developer productivity, I think the best sort of way to understand it is to think about uh, the, the, the sort of the pseudocode of writing code. It's like this like nested set of for loops. Like what is the workflow? Like you have this like almost like a nested set of for loops. Sorry if this is like philosophical. I'll get to the technical, I promise, like 10 minutes, but I think this is important. So like you have this like innermost loop where you're like writing code and then you like run it and you get a syntax error and you fix it or whatever, or like maybe unit test fails. But like so the innermost loop, you're talking like seconds of feed, you know, the, the, the feedback is like seconds. Uh, slightly bigger loop would be like something like a unit test or running the script locally or something like that and it fails in some way and then you fix it. So that's like minutes. Then you're like, you know, you're like done with a set of commits, you push it to GitHub uh, to, to create a pull request or something like that. You have to wait for a coworker to look at it or CI CD to run or something like that. Now it's like hours. And then you like merge it and you deploy it to production. And now it's like, I don't know, days, right? Let's say you're like building a cron job and you're like, this is gonna be world's greatest cron job. It's gonna run at midnight and you ship it. And, I don't, and you're like sitting around, you're like, it's midnight and it doesn't run. This is like something I think most people have experienced at some point. Because you like forgot a semicolon in the YAML or something like that. So, so now you have to go back and like add that semicolon, deploy it again, wait until next midnight. So this is kind of just an example of like you have this like super long feedback loop, nothing happens, uh, and you know that that sort of to me ruins the joy of writing code. It's not fun when you have to wait. And I think it's good to like contrast this with with other types of software engineers. I was a CTO for many years. I looked at other you know, software engineers. People look down, I feel like almost like people look down on like front engineers. I don't know why, because like front engineers, they kind of figured it out. Like they have amazing tools, so fast. Like they put like code on one monitor, they put like the, the website on another, and then they like write the code and it like hot reloads and they get this like super fast like feedback loop. It's almost like this immediate gratification, right? There's something like very gratifying about doing front end. If you haven't tried, you should. It's actually a lot of fun. Uh, back end, sorry about this like image. This is like my placeholder image. I put back end engineer into stable diffusion. This is what I got. Um, it's like you write code, you like, does it compile? You know, does it pass? I actually wonder if like a lot of back end engineers are very much into like compiler or like they like strongly typed languages. And my theory is like it's actually less about the quality, like the, the, the guarantees that it has. It's more about the feedback loops. You get this like, okay, like the Rust compiler telling you you have to fix this thing. So you have this like, it's kind of nice. Uh, they have unit tests often, so that's nice. You can hear it with that, and then they ship it. But then you look at like data teams, and like I don't know what your experience is writing data stuff, like building data apps. Like my experience is like it's pretty frustrating because you have just like cron jobs that take. You have talked about cron jobs, but also like training models or like scaling things out. 
you know, if you're running things on a lot of data, you have to wait. I'm old. I used to use Hadoop a lot, of, you know, growing up, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Maybe not, yeah, 15 years ago. Um, which is like, you know, I really don't, you know, wish my kids have to use something like this. It would take like super, like you have to write like a MapReduce job. Like luckily we, we did it in Python at Spotify. But, but you have to sit around and wait for like an hour for, for your like simple query to run. Today there's like data warehouses. So I think there's a much better way. You get this like feedback loops. But I think it's sort of, in a way actually I think this has gotten worse in the like last five years with the feedback loops. Because we started using containers. We started using a bunch of stuff. And it got a little bit worse. So, okay, I'm almost done with the like, philosophical stuff, and then we'll talk about tech. I think a lot of the problem with these feed, you know, this like how to compress the feedback loops is about taking concerns from the outermost loops and putting them back in the innermost loops. And in particular, one of the biggest concerns I have, one of the biggest issues I have, is that the infrastructure happens in the outermost loop. And a lot of stuff is bad with, uh, with, with, with these feedback loops because things break in the outermost thing once you deployed it in ways that it didn't break locally. And because these outermost loops are slow, it's like slow, it takes time to push code to the cloud. Like people start to like write code locally instead. And they're like, oh, I'm just gonna run this thing. I'm gonna ignore all the Docker containers, like whatever, I'm just gonna run this thing. But then you make the problem even worse because you like, you know, create like a divergence in environments. Uh, which means like you create this like separation of environments, which means you introduce like new differences. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about technology. What are containers? Um, containers, I think, are my mental model of a container is basically that it is a Linux root file system. So like, if you open a container, if you look inside of it, it basically has like slash user, slash etc, slash lib, like all these things that a Linux computer has, so like a VM or, or a physical computer. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff too. There's um, uh, some security stuff, the resource isolation, but this is kind of like conceptually what a container does. And you can actually do this. Like you can like sort of drill a hole in the container and like, you know, use it. And, and I'll talk a lot about Docker, but Docker is like arguably just one implementation of like a standard the OCI container spec. Uh, I'll get back to that in a second. So here's like one example. We pull this container, this is Python, it's like a standard Python, you use Debian Slim. It's on Docker Hub, and you pull that, and you, you open the container, like if you, you can run this command, like docker save, sorry, docker export, it's docker save too. Docker's a very confusing CLI, it always mix them up. It's docker save works on images, but you get the layers, it's very annoying. So docker export on a container, you get basically this tarball, and if you extract that, you have this like whole root file system on disk, right? And that's kind of how Docker sort of works, right? Like Docker, one of the foundational primitives is this syscall in Linux called chroot. And chroot basically, if you have a Linux machine and then you have a root file system on some directory inside this Linux machine, like you have like a, you know, like a, a root file system inside a root file system, you can point it to this like, you know, the one inside and say, actually run an operating system from here. Like here's like a distribution and run it from here. So chroot is like one primitive. And then there's a little bit of other stuff. There's some C groups and some other stuff. Um, okay, so th that was like, you know, so let's take it back. Like what do we actually want to accomplish here? So what I started thinking about is like, what if we can like retain the, the loop, like, you know, writing code locally, but, but instead of running things locally, what if we can actually put it in a container and launch it in the cloud. So I want to take code locally, I want to spin up a container in the cloud, and I want to run that inside an arbitrary container. And I want to do that so fast that it kind of feels like, you know, almost like local development, maybe even better than local development, right? Uh, and so, so sort of, you know, and, and so, so we have all these like workers in the cloud, we have a thousand machines, you know, n machines in the cloud, and we want to support an arbitrary container to launch in the cloud uh, and we want to do that in about a second. And we want to put code in it, too. And so, um, does this work? It doesn't work. There's a video here. It doesn't work. It's okay. Uh, you can imagine. I'm sure you've seen the screen. It's like some progress bar. You pull down a Docker image. It takes like a minute, maybe. Sometimes 10 seconds, sometimes a minute. It depends on how big it is. Like, Docker images are, like, often pretty large, especially if, you know, standard Docker images is, like, maybe a gigabyte, like a Linux distribution. There's, like, slimmer ones at 100 megabytes. But once you start putting in like CUDA, you start putting in Torch, like whatever, 
TensorFlow, I don't know. They, they balloon off into like 10 gigabytes. So pulling down a Docker image on a remote host can take like a minute or two, right, or more, which is kind of absurd in a way, actually, because there's nowhere near like saturating the network. Like 10 gigabyte today in AWS, like interconnect should be like a couple of seconds. So I don't know what Docker is doing, but it's not, you know, very fast. Um, how do we optimize this? If we want to take code locally and run it in a container in the cloud, we want to do that with the second latency. Uh, one observation is that if pulling down an image is slow, can we optimize this? Okay, so a lot of containers have a lot of crap in them, right? Like you, you start looking into this container, you see, you know, this is a fairly small container, it's one only not even a gigabyte, but like, you know, there's a lot of like time zone information. Time zone for like places that, you know, you're never gonna use. There's like time zone for like uninhabited islands, Uzbekistan, your app is never gonna like need those, right? Those are not very large. It may be a kilobyte each, but it's like, you add it up, you know, like you're not gonna need all these files. And so a lot of the stuff in this container is never actually gonna be read, like never. And so one thought is like, we can optimize these images, right? And that's been like sort of one way people go about this, solving this problem is like, Let's just like, you know, remove all the stuff, you know, build this like super weird like Docker file that like optimizes. I think that's like kind of a waste of time in my opinion because I think there's better ways to do it. Um, and I think the better ways to do it, so I'm just gonna drink some water, is to observe what actually happens when you start a container. So, so let's, you know, so what happens when, we're focusing on Python right now because Python is like most commonly used uh, programming language for data teams. Sorry, I just had to drink some water. I've been talking to so many people and my voice is like, it's gonna get like progressively like uh, raspier. Um, what happens when you start a container is the Python interpreter is gonna start and then you're gonna import a bunch of uh, Python packages. So here's, here's scikit-learn is a good example. It's a popular machine learning library in, in, in package in, in Python. When you import um, scikit-learn, it reads about a thousand files. So so, so and, and it, it also does about 3,000 system calls to stat. Stat is like a system call to, to, to get the file information from a file. So it's good and bad news. Good news is like, this is a lot of system calls. This is a lot of file operations. But the good news is that we're only actually accessing about 1,000 files. Actually, even slightly less, because some of these are like duplicates. Uh, so that's only 3% of the files in this image. And, and by, uh, by, by uh, size of the file, I think it's even less. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the first files it's gonna access is gonna be like the, the Python interpreter itself, then it's gonna be a bunch of shared object files, like a bunch of libraries, and then it's gonna read like something like 800 Python modules. You know, Python modules are also like the Py files, but then it does a stat to check if the PyC file is there, because it's a pre-compiled um, uh, a Python module, because Python does that. So it, it does a little, there's a little bit of redundancy too. Okay, so, so let's, you know, Docker feels like not the right tool at this point, like for running containers fast. Like we want to boot containers pretty fast. In, you know, let's, you know, kind of rehab, rehash what, what I want to do. I want to take code that exists on a local computer, my laptop. I want to spin up an arbitrary container in the cloud out of a pool of N workers and, uh, and then run that container, right? And, and Docker's too slow. So, uh, for, because it takes too much time to pull down the image. Okay, so there is a small little component of Docker called Run C. Run C is um, uh, is used by Docker, but it doesn't contain all this like stuff to pull and push images. It doesn't contain the, the daemon. All it does is like you point it to a root file system. You also give it a JSON configuration. It has some network stuff, but that's not important for this. And then it runs the container. So that's kind of nice. So you can like basically put a root file system on your laptop. You can say run, run C, please start a container from here, and then it starts a container. And then that's all it does. And then you can kill it at some point later. Uh, so here's like a very janky sort of Rube Goldberg like first version of what I built uh, to, to prove that you can start containers quickly over the network is what if we take all these images and we put them on NFS, which is a network file system. And then I basically tell run C, please start a container from this image over here that's like a full like unpacked like root file system, like has the user, ETC, you know, all these like things. Uh, 
And runc of obviously it doesn't know whether it's like a local or remote file system. It doesn't matter. All it needs is a file system. So it'll happily do that. And um, it will run the container. And so this means we don't have to wait to pull down the image, right? It's suddenly very fast to start to, to pull down the image. However, starting the container is not very slow. And why is that? It's because you, know, you saw this S trace thing uh, with, with import sklearn. Python does a lot of operations sequentially. It reads like a thousand Python modules, like one by one. Uh, and, and NFS latency is a few milliseconds. So if you're doing you know, 4,000 file operations and each file operations is two milliseconds, how many seconds is that? Does anyone know? Eight seconds, very good. Multiplying numbers. Uh, so eight seconds is kind of slow. It's better, I mean, it's like not terrible. It's faster than most stuff. But I still feel like it's like, it's not good. It's like, it doesn't spark joy. It's like you launch a container, you want it to feel much faster. So, and the fast latency doesn't feel good enough. And you can use EBS, it's a little bit faster. Uh, uh, and, uh, but what, what, what really makes a difference is like, what if you can cache stuff locally on the worker that's executing, executing these containers? Because local SSD latency is on the order of 100 microseconds. So that suddenly is like a much nicer thing. And of course, the Linux page cache is even better. So now we're talking like a couple microseconds. Okay, so caching is good for two reasons. And the two reasons is like, one of the reasons is like, if we're reading the same image over and over and we're caching the files, then the second time we launch the same image we can launch that image much faster. But as it turns out, a lot of images have a lot of overlap in the files that they contain. And so, as an example, I just took like three large images from Docker Hub and just kind of look at the intersection, did a Venn diagram. And uh, as it turns out, like even unrelated images have zero, you know, these images have zero layers in common. Uh, Docker has this like optimization that caches layers but these, these images have zero layers in common. But even, even without layers in common, most of the files are common, or most of the files that we read, in, in, at least. So as it turns out, like even caching you know, unrelated images, you get a nice performance boost, because you can, you can get very high cache efficiency, even if people are running like arbitrary custom images with zero layers in common, if we can cache the files. Caching the files, it gets a little bit more complex now. Caching the files, in order to do that, we're going to use like a, 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 an old trick. I think you know this trick has been many people have come up with this because it's kind of an obvious once you think about it. Back in you know starting with the 60s in the 60s and 70s, I think people came up with this. We're going to do something that's called content addressing. So content addressing means you hash every file by its con like you hash the content, and then you use the content the hash as a location of that file, right? And the nice thing about this is that we only have to store every single file once. Even though one file is on like a thousand images, we only have to store it once. So that's really nice from a storage point of view. The second reason why it's nice is from a caching point of view. If you know, the same file is accessed, even like you know, they might show up in different location in different images, uh, we can cache it the second time. So, so that's one way to, to get low latency when you're reading files. Uh, and so, we ended up doing this by building uh, a simple file system in Fuse. And here's the secret. People think building file systems is hard. It's not that hard. So you can do this, even in Python, you can actually build a file system. And we did this in the first version of this. We built a very janky proof of concept in Python that basically exposes a file system to run C, but it's not like, you know, physical file system. What it does under the hood is it goes over the network and it fetches files by these like uh, uh, the, the hashes that we computed in advance. And I'll get back to how we compute them in, the, in advance. And then we cache them locally on the local SSD. Even in Python, this actually turns out to be faster than doing it, the whole thing, you know, putting everything on NFS. Uh, but we ended up rewriting it in Rust, uh, because, which is a much better language for this. Anyway, I'm much faster. Uh, and, and, and it turns out, I mean, like this file system in particular, I think I forgot maybe one or two here. I think stats should be here. 
But Fuse, Fuse has like, I think, 40 different things you have to implement. But that's like supporting uh, a writable file system. In this case, it's read-only. We use OverlayFS on top of that to, to make it writable. Uh, but, then it, but we only have to support a read-only file system, which means like we only have to implement like five or six methods. Uh, so that actually, actually makes it a lot easier. And then what do we do in this file system? This file system basically keeps an index in memory of the layout of the, of the, the, the disk, the, the root file system. And for every, you know, for every location, it contains two things. It contains the hash, which defines the, the location of, this, of this, uh, the content, and a, a stat struct. And so stat, it's like an old you know, Linux thing that basically contains like the permission bits, whether it's an executable, and a few other things. Uh, and, and, you know, which is only like, I don't know, 20 bytes or something like that, very, very simple. OK. So now, RunC wants to read a file. We basically do this. We, t we look up in the index. Let's say RunC wants to read whatever, the Python interpreter. So that is under like user bin, whatever Python. User bin Python, I think. Depends on the distribution. Um, we then look up in this in-memory map where like user bin Python has this hash. And we go and see on local SSD, do we have that in disk? If that's the case, then we just return it. And we get the benefit of the page cache too in Linux because it caches like the, the files. If we don't have it, then we're going to have to go ask a remote service to fetch it. But that doesn't really happen that often because we can cache these things like very efficiently. So we get pretty good uh, uh, cache efficiency. So this, this drives down the latency. But if we, we fetch it, then we store it on the local SSD so it's cached for the next time. OK. So we talked about running images, is it right, running containers. Um, running containers. So, so we have new, now like a, a way basically to take code, put it in a container in the cloud, and like run it on a low, you know, remote cloud computer. But all this file system stuff means we need to pre-compute a lot of stuff. Like for every container image, we now have to um, pre-build this index. We need to build this index and store it somewhere. So that when we launched uh, run C, we, uh, we 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 know we have this in advance. And the very janky version is, you know, so, so we, we stopped using Docker for running containers, but first version we're still going to use Docker for building containers. And so the slow bad way to do it is, you want to build this index like of like a root file system. So we still use Docker for building the image, and then we take the container, we take the container image, we export it to disk. We compute checksums of every single file in that, uh, on that, um, in that directory, uh, which is, you know, could be like 30,000 files or 100,000 or whatever. And then we store that index on NFS too. And this turns out to be kind of annoying too. People don't need to build images that often, but it's still like this is way too slow. It takes like several minutes. And, and it's, you know, let's say you want to just install a Python package. I find it kind of annoying if it takes a minute. And so what is building an image? Building a container image is, if you think about it, essentially just running a container and then running a command. Like the cornerstone of Docker is like the run command, right? There's a bunch of other commands to it. But if you're, running a, uh, if you're building an image, essentially what you happen is you're running an arbitrary shell command in a container, and then the result of that container, you snapshot that back to a new image. Uh, so our, the idea here is basically, and Docker does the same thing. With, we use overlayFS. So we start a container, then we use overlayFS, which is this like temporary like layered file system. We run an arbitrary command inside this container using the machinery we already built using run C. And then it writes all the new data to a separate directory uh, using overlayFS. And then we can just look at all the delta, upload any files we haven't seen so far to NFS, and then compute this index. The only problem here is like we need, now need to implement a Docker file parser ourselves, because we're throwing out Docker. But we wanted to support Docker files because Docker files are kind of nice. Like people understand Docker files and it's sort of, you know, well understood sort of. And doc so yeah, so like we have to implement a, you know, but here's like the, you know, we did this in Rust. Like here's like one, you know, there's a, there's a big like match statement and this is the run uh, uh, branch of this. Like it, it's not that many commands. It's the run, copy, env. There's like a few other ones, work dir, entry point. We basically support all of them now. It's not that hard, but it's kind of annoying. Okay, so I talked about 
running containers very fast. Like we now have the, the ability to start a container in the cloud in about a second, running custom images, and we also put the user code inside of it. Uh, I talked about building containers, building container images very fast. There's a bunch of other stuff we also need to do. So we also need to maintain a pool of worker instances in the cloud. We need to scale that up and down. Uh, and we need to build a scheduling mechanism that takes uh, uh, work that we have to do and assigns it to, to the workers in the cloud. So that's sort of what Kubernetes does, uh, but we decided to do that ourselves too. And so it's like conceptually, I think it's, this one is like less complex, but it's probably in code more. Uh, we basically, instead of like leveraging like existing tools, like we, we use the low level like EC2 APIs. And so we spawn uh, uh, workers, we spawn instances using EC2, and then we terminate them ourselves. And that way we can actually auto scale very quickly. Launching an EC2 is actually very fast. It only takes 40 seconds. It's much slower than GCP for some reason. Um, and then, you know, we do a little bit of a trick with like over provisioning because because modal, modal is multi-tenant, so we run a lot of different users' code on modal. And so we get the benefit of pooling all that variance, right? Like the total variance goes down with like one over a square root of n, the relative variance. So, so the nice thing is like when you do that, you get a much smoother sort of overall load. So it's kind of a nice thing to have, but there's still gonna be like spikes. Like someone comes in and wants to run like a lot of stuff. So we, we have always a little bit of margin, like in case like someone needs to scale up very quickly. We have a few like standby instances. Uh, and then the other thing we need to think about is driving utilization, right? Like one of the benefits of multi-tenants is we can potentially improve utilization a lot, which is a massive economic incentive for us, like because it lowers our cost of, of, of goods. Uh, and we do that primarily by like monitoring every worker, checking the, the CPU, GPU and memory, and then, uh, and then allocating work to workers based on you know, predicted resource utilization and, and current resource utilization of those workers. And this basically turns out into this like, function as a service platform. So, so what we realize is like, instead of like, users running containers, actually the nice primitive that I think people want is functions. So that's what modal does. Sorry, I, I should have like, included a bunch of slides about modal, but I didn't want to like, be like, an obnoxious vendor, so I didn't do that. So that's why I'm only talking about technology, but you can go check it out on the website later, modal.com. So we built basically like a function as a service platform, right, on top of this. Because we have all this functionality to start containers very quickly. And so the idea is like in Python, you can write you know, a fun function in Python, and you can put a decorator on it, and then that gives you the ability, we can deploy that to the cloud in about a second, and then you can call that function. And you don't have to think about scaling, it scales up and down, it scales down to zero, right? So there's a little bit more work also to support you know, this like function as a service, like besides scaling the overall resource pool we also have to scale like for every function, like how many workers does it, have, or how many containers does that uh, function have. But the nice thing is, particular application where this turns out to be super useful for, for is GPUs. So GPUs are very expensive, right? So people who run particular inference on GPU, they have like very unpredictable loads, and so you know, they they need the ability like so serverless GPUs. Financially, is a product that makes a lot of sense for people. People don't want to provision a bunch, like a G GPU cluster that just sits idle in case there's like a peak. You know, you don't want to provision for peak capacity because that's very expensive because you have all these GPU instances that are just sitting underutilized. What you want to do is you want to auto scale up and down as work comes in. And you need to scale very quickly. So all this stuff around like, build, like booting containers quickly turns out to be super useful when you're doing function as a service, in particular for this GPU stuff. GPU has a bunch of other like, more complex stuff, because not just do you need to boot the containers quickly, you also need to like load potentially very large models like from network to disk, hopefully it's already cached, then from disk to CPU, and then from CPU to GPU. And we're talking like stable diffusion is like five gigabytes. So it's very important to like Im improve all these like bottlenecks from cold start. Um, what does this let us do? Yeah, I mean, does this work? I don't think it works. There's a video of like running modal, but it doesn't work. Uh, but like, yeah, I mean like one of the things that let's just do, it, I'll tell you this video. You can imagine it in your head. Uh, this is basically like, builds a container, it builds a container image uh, in a few seconds and then stores it in our distributed storage. And then right after it launches 100 containers with this image 
and you know, all in like a handful of like five to ten seconds, right? So, 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 so now we're starting to get to this point where like we're almost like better than local development in the sense that like you know we can build containers locally. You don't have to think about Docker. I don't know about you. I don't. I'm not a big fan of Docker. The CLI is very unintuitive to me. Uh, and we can build, but we can build arbitrary containers. We can launch them in the cloud, and we can scale up and down very quickly. So we have this ability now to like, you can build this like fan out thing, uh, and 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 you have this feedback loop that almost like it feels like you're writing code locally, but it actually executes in the cloud. You have the scalability of the cloud. And I mean, here's like one example. You know, it's a lot of stable diffusion, a lot of dream booth, like a lot of people running this kind of stuff. Some of them more gimmicky, some of them more serious. Uh, but like a lot of, you know, so, so, so like a lot of GPU stuff, people run a modal. It's also, also a lot of other stuff. Like people run like web scraping, computational biotech, data pipelines. There's a lot of the stuff that you can run a modal and sort of nice. Was it dumb to build this in-house? I think for most people, it would be a very bad idea to do that. You should use a vendor instead, maybe modal. Uh, I think in the long run, my feeling is like Kubernetes is this thing that is good enough for a lot of stuff, but it's not great for anything. And in particular for data teams, I think Kubernetes is pretty annoying to deal with. And so what I've seen is a lot of companies internally, they build a data platform that's a wrapper on top of Kubernetes, and then the wrapper ends up being kind of leaky because you know it doesn't so handle all the cases. And then people have to learn Kubernetes anyway. And so my feeling is like you can't like solve these like big problems by just like putting wrappers on top of wrappers on top of wrappers, right? You know, we wanted like full stack engineers, but the stack is full. There's like too much stuff in the stack. Like you can't fit more stuff in the stack. So anyway, so and then, you know, and should we have used it? Like, Docker's too slow. That's, we don't want to use Docker. In Kubernetes, I think, you know, maybe you could have gone into I don't know. You could have used Lambda, maybe, but like, Lambda's pretty expensive. They don't support GPUs, you know. So, so for us, it was the right thing to do and, and to go down in this, you know. It was also fun, but that's like me rationalizing maybe like the other stuff. But, um, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>